with aloha authentic. Hui, aloha, and welcome to our 20th episode of Aloha Authentic with Kamako Pili. We are so stoked and proud to continue our third season, and who better to do our next episode with than Waterman himself, Uncle Pohaku Stone. Mahalo, Uncle, for hey, coming. Aloha, we appreciate man. Mahalo. it. We're excited today because surfing is the passion and the love of all Hawaiian people, no matter what part of the island or what yeah. end that you come from. Surfing is a universal thing. So today we're going to spend our 30, 25, 26 minutes on talking about that. But before we get to that, we cannot forget our protocol here on Aloha Authentic. Just to fill you in for those first timers, we have a bowl of poi right in the center of the table. The meaning of that is that Tutu always said, when growing up and the bowl of poi is on the dinner table, no negativity is spoken and only positivity oh, because all yeah. that bad energy is going to sour the poi, yeah? Roger and not that. A, not a good kind sour. So today's story is all about that, about creation, about love, about aloha. So grab your bowl of poi, grab your poke, and come join us. Moving oh, along, and before we get there, I know there's always, I always forget this one section, but did you know, we're continuing our Did You Know series, and today, did you know about Vauke? Now, Vauke is a plant that is used for multiple different things within Hawaiian culture. And just to give a little brief snippet, Vauke has multiple uses ranging from making kappa bark cloth, which is a traditional Hawaiian cloth, to making lashings and ropes, to even being a strong laxative. For that laxative, if need be, scrape off the bark of the, of the Vauke, you soak that bark with one part of pa'akai or salt. Allow it to ferment and become all slimy. That slime part is the thing or that, the, that content that you want to drink. Within that, that horrible, smelly, tasting, Stay on that, that ar aroma, all the ononess and that medicinal part of that plant, what Akua gave to us naturally, is within that. So if you need be, no need go down safely. Go into the backyard of your friend who get Vauke and, <coughs> and get that laxative for you. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, that was our Did you know? So let's move Did you know about surfing. Uncle, okay. mahalo nui. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, we feel Mahalo yo, oi. Com okay, coming yo from ba. my ohana, my dad being a surfer, my whole family coming from the beach, I'm very intrigued about learning more about where surfing came from. You know, today, Surfing is so high paced, so fast paced, that whole sport and just energy of wanting to jump in the water and catch the wave. You know, I mean, it is. It is today. But when we look at it, because we're people born from the ocean, mm -hmm. right? We're ocean people. We're not really land people. Land is just a place we come to rest. Mm -hmm. And so surfing being that unique part of who we are, because it's almost like it keeps us in tune with our 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 journey, mm -hmm. you know, our, our migration across the oceans. And we're still migrating today, mm -hmm. right? And so surfing is just a unique part of us. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can't let it go. Yeah, yeah. it's always going to be there. Always. So f it, with all your, I mean, you, you're a life man. And you spent your life in the water. And you're from and doing some research before I came here. You know all the different competitions well, you've done or the me. challenges, <laughs> crossing the different channels. I believe you're the only one who crossed every single channel in the state. Yep. So with all of that, I mean that I would never do that, just by the way. <laughs> but yeah. with all that experience, yeah. like, what you know, for you, where where does surfing start for you? Well, you know, it was I don't know, I was just born to do it. I mm -hmm. I mean because because I grew up in, a, in an old way, unbeknownst to me at the time as a kid. So when I, when I started, it was only because I always was on the beach. And my earliest memories on the beach, I lived on Wainani Way, Paokalani, Liliokalani, all over Waikiki. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Havi. Uh, I grew up uh, Mo'omomi, you know, up at Ho'olehu and Molokai. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, just, just various places in the island that my parents sent me because I was more Hanai, you know. They, they wanted me to grow up with my great uncles and, and uh, aunts and stuff like that. So I grew up with, with, with the families, the various families. And in that process, it was always connected to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so surfing, though finds its roots for me actually in Waikiki and it's only because you know nobody had surfboards except for the one that my dad made when I was really young I think I was five six years old or something uh, 
that's my earliest memory of a traditional wood board. Mm -hmm. And like I always tell the story is that I didn't like it when he completed it. And I told him, ah, I was a little kid. I hate it. I, so he broke it and burned him. What? <laughs> got rid of him. And Learned you a lesson. <laughs> yeah. It was a, but obviously, he set me on my path. Mm -hmm. um, and it was years later that I found out that he was a renowned surfer. You know, I never knew my dad surfed. So I didn't think he knew anything about surfing because I wanted that shiny fiberglass surfboard in the mm -hmm. windows, right, like every other kid. Well, more or less, I wanted to keep up with the Joneses when I was the Kanak. <laughs> 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 and, and so, you know, what I got is, for me, surfing was with, um, was with, you know, a little bit with Duke, but most of it is with uh, Anakala uh, Steamboat. Blue mm -hmm. Makua, Uncle Rabbit, mm -hmm. and all those guys who taught me, you know, how to enjoy what surfing really is. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about competing. It was about why you, why are you like surf, mm -hmm. you know? And for me, it was going out and catching a wave and gliding on it, which is what everybody that ever experiences surfing wants to do. Mm -hmm. But before you could do that, you had to be able to carry these wood boards. Mm -hmm. So my experience was... Every day as a kid in Waikiki, you know, I'd be sand sliding, I'd be mm -hmm. like, you know, pipe boarding off the wall, kapulu wall, and then I'd go down when I had time and I'd try and lift those boards, right? <laughs> and hey, I was like a, like a, like a small kid. <laughs> Carrying a 400 pound board. Oh <laughs> That's what it seemed like, but now today I think yeah, I was super light. <laughs> They were just giving me a hard time, my uncle. Oh, that right? must have been, so that's all beach boys. So yep. growing up in that, I mean, that within itself, in Waikiki, on that beach, had its energy of itself. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people today who became professionals, you know, because I don't count myself as a professional, even though the surfing industry might look at me like that. Mm -hmm. I really don't look at myself like that. I look at it because it's what I love to do. Mm -hmm. I don't do it for competition. So growing up at that era, mm -hmm. uh, I really, really am grateful for the time they gave me. And the fact is that I grew up understanding it eventually. You mm -hmm. know, it took a half a lifetime to yeah. figure it out. <laughs> so with that, I mean, in my knowledge and what I'm aware of, the whole Beach Boy Duke Hanamoku scene, I mean, Duke Hanamoku himself is known to be the godfather of modern right. surfing, being the one to introduce surfing around the world. And from that point is where this whole ball of evolution to what we know surfing today has started to take place. For you, what is the, the difference between the type of surfing that we have now compared to what our kupuna and how they approached and looked at surfing? Well, you know, today's surfing has to be, you know, you have to be good at what you do riding the type of modern boards we have today. But what makes a difference is that the ability of our kupuna to ride wooden boards from that era and the various designs that were there took a lot of talent because mm -hmm. you can't just paddle one of those boards get up on it and think you're going to ride away it just doesn't work mm -hmm. like that <laughs> it's it takes a lot of a lot of training and mm -hmm. their ability to surf far exceeds ours mm -hmm. because we have to use technology to create the fins you know, to, to, to direct the board. Where riding wood boards, you actually use your, your body, your weight adjustment. You have to know your positions on the board. You gotta know how the wave's breaking. There's a lot of scientific mm -hmm. technology that goes into that riding traditional boards. Yeah, they understood. You're right, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, I don't, I don't sell anybody short in today's modern surfing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think most of the surfing world appreciates what they got mm -hmm. from us mm -hmm. as natives bringing surfing to them, mm -hmm. right? What is, so um, traditional surfing, I've, I've heard little snippets of what it, the role it played in the past. To your mana'o, where did, especially with Hawaiian Ali'i, what was the role of surfing? Well, with the Hawaiian Ali'i, it was, you know, there was like two folds to our, our ali'i when they surfed, right? 
One is they served openly with everybody. Mm -hmm. And the other one was definitely to, you know, show everyone their mana, mm -hmm. right? That they were the best at this. And it's that time when they came out as ali'i mm -hmm. and had to compete against one another or just to, you know, provide the reason why our people should follow them mm -hmm. was their, willing to, their willingness to sacrifice themselves. Because when we think of surfing today, we're just riding away. Mm -hmm. when, when surfing was done by our, our Ali'i Nui in the old time, that was a life or death situation because it wasn't just riding a big wave, it was where they rode it. Mm -hmm. You know, they would have to ride their surfboards over rock shelves and to be able to land in a specific place mm -hmm. and everything. And if you missed, <laughs> are we? <laughs> that's all there's I can say. There's not a big enough Band-Aid to cover that one. No, <laughs> there is no Band-Aid. So that's the difference on that. I, I've come across that, that saying, surfing is the sports of the elite. What, what is your interpretation of that? Well, I think that was a, um, that was a early 20th century interpretation because what they wanted to do was uh, their effort you know, during our colonial periods was to promote tourism. Mm -hmm. And the way to promote tourism with Alexander Hume Ford, who actually, you know, uh, began the Outrigger Canoe Club, his effort was to take surfing and make it a royal sport because mm -hmm. it was an attempt to bring, uh, you know, the, the wealthy mm -hmm. people of the world to Hawaii which it, it, it worked. Mm -hmm. And those that came mostly were the Wahine mm -hmm. of, of the world because they were the wealthy ones, right? So they'd come to Hawaii and, and they'd learn how to surf. And so all the men of the world followed them. Mm -hmm. And it was because they wanted to be seen as royalty, mm -hmm. right? But that's not the way it really was. What the re really the way it was is that surfing was a, a cultural practice of our people, mm -hmm. of who we are, and, and that's what we did. Everybody surfed. Mm -hmm. We surfed because it was natural for us to do it. Mm -hmm. And so this, this whole role that they perpetuate today of, you know, sport of kings, it is, but it's not that, you know, you, you relegate the, the, uh, the rest of us as people mm -hmm. outside of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a selling point. Yeah. Yeah. So. All that being said, I mean, I know there's about 10 or so different types of traditional boards. And today, we, you're very fortunate. I mean, we're very fortunate that you brought a few. So if we can, if you, if you don't mind, just what the different types of traditional surfboards are there? You know, it's good that you <coughs> ask that because <coughs> there's, a, there's a problem today and a lot of history that's done. And, and, and most of the history of surfing <coughs> is written outside of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. it's, it's through California, Australia, and elsewhere. And so there's this idea that we had <coughs> three different types of boards, sorry. <coughs> and it's those three types of boards that, that, that's a problematic because we had like 10 mm -hmm. different types of traditional boards that I know of. And there could have been more, right? Mm -hmm. But I grew up learning about 10 of them. And so when people talk about, they say an Alaya, Olo, and Paipo. Number one, Paipo is not a Hawaiian name, and it actually, Paipo originates out of San Diego, mm -hmm. and that was an effort through Alexander Hume Ford to uh, maintain his property mm -hmm. <laughs> because he kept losing the boards, right? Mm -hmm. The tourists would take it out, they'd lose the boards, and, the, and us as Canucks, we'd take it home. <laughs> and that, that's really the truth, as told to me mm -hmm. by Uncle Rabbit, uh, Uncle Blue, and stuff like that. <coughs> And uh, <clears throat> so Piper Board is actually takes its origin from what we call a paha. Mm -hmm. And a paha is, you know, just a half board, right? It's sort of, so, uh, you know, that's what most people were riding were pahas or omos at the time, which is the most common type of board, right? And then uh, the alaya, alaya, as I call it, right? Because there's always, you know, I mean, we can argue it, everybody can argue it, but. Mm -hmm. Unless you've ridden and what people call an alaya, 
it's actually, if you pronounce it, it's aleo, right? Mm -hmm. It's talking about the path of the fish. And the reason mm -hmm. it, it's talking about that is because when you take one of those boards, which is, which is this, this is what people call an alaya, <coughs> it flexes, mm -hmm. right? And it's that flexibility that allows you to make the turns with it and everything. It's like a fish mm -hmm. swimming through the water. Wow. So it turns very quickly, you know, because it's always, always bending and flexing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when I look at it, you know, I understand what it is. So a lot of people that ride boards, they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, it's not to say that, oh, you know, there's anything wrong with that. They're just not from, from our culture. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's okay. So you really have more of a true relationship and connection with the board itself because you got to know how the board works. Yeah, you should know why the board the works and why it's named, you know. Like, you know, our kupuna, they gave names to these boards. It was based on a natural uh, part of our environment, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, the pu'ua, like, it's, it's, it's amazing and, and, you know, similar to the ki'oi. But, but the pu'ua is similar to a large uh, alaya, right, mm -hmm. that's maybe, you know, can get up to 17 feet tall, but the pu'ua bottom is different. And so what it is, is when they created this, this style of board, they looked at a raindrop oh. and, you know, a raindrop and how, how the raindrops <coughs> fall on a pu'u on a hillside and would slide down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you ride it, you understand why it was named like that because the board resembles something mm -hmm. like that. So all the boards that I ride and make, they, I, you know, understand why they were made mm -hmm. and what type of waves they're supposed to ride. Mm -hmm. So the pu'ua is more of a board like the kiko'o, which is in here. Those are very large boards. They're, they're created to ride large sloping waves with a lot of face on them, mm -hmm. you know, and they glide through the water just like, you know, so. So you go down to the beach, do your homework mm -hmm. first before you go back home, pick know what type of board to go pick to go well, surf those waves yeah i kind of yeah. <laughs> i kind of pack well, when it. you live next to the beach in the water it's not that difficult well, i pack <laughs> everything on the car and i just go <laughs> because if i'm not going to ride them there's going to be other people like ride so yeah. i just take awesome. them but i what, know what i'm doing what about this little kicky one over oh here? this one right here the uma right so the you know the uma is is very unique because it was something that just by chance that, that I took the time to, well, I didn't take the time, but I was, I was researching some stuff and I was looking at the Cook's uh, uh, voyage into Tahiti when he was talking about, you know, the people gliding across the water like birds mm. and being a body surfer too, you know, we don't, ever stop to think about okay how did they get that and so when I so when I started writing this I realized how they get it mm -hmm. because what it is is this is like an uma is a chessboard right mm -hmm. so the way this is written is you have to be able to get your body up on it after you catch the wave you have to be able to slide up on it and the only way so you, you can balance on it oh. is with your hands up and so you don't even see the board yeah and your chest right so when they were in Tahiti they never saw the board, right? Because to me, for years, I always went, nope, nope, that, you know, Tahitian, Samoan, mm -hmm. to add, I never came up with surfing. But when I thought about it, and I find, you know, and, I, and it dawned on me, because there's, there's a board in the Bishop Museum that everybody looks at, and they just call it a pipo or something. Mm -hmm. I went, no way. But it's, but it's called an uma, and I went, oh, why is that board called an uma? And so when I made it, and I started writing it, I understood why. Wow. Because you don't see the board, and the trick is, if if the board slides out from under, you, you know your you know the body surfing stops. Mm -hmm. And to be good at it, you have to be able to control it. And the only way you control it is by your body positioning on the board, and your hands are up in the air. Wow. And that's it. The, other than that, it's not going to stay with you. So you have to be able to push into it and <laughs> out from it, and, and it's like your your fingertips are touching the water, just like a you know, an albatross wood and mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know, it's sick. It's amazing. Awesome. 
So with this, I mean, that, the biggest thing that I'm getting back is that connection that the surfer has with the board. That being said, from the tree to a final board and all the process and that everything in between, what does that consist of making an actual board and that whole ritual side or that the spiritual side of surfing? Well, you know, I mean, we know we go through the blessing of the tree and stuff like that mm -hmm. before, it's, before it's taken. But for us, you know, for myself and the group that we're with, Kanalu, you know, which is a nonprofit Hawaiian organization dedicated to education, is that we don't, we don't take live trees, mm -hmm. you know, because it's so important because it's getting rare, mm -hmm. our, our native trees. And so what we do is if we find people that are cutting down like the ulu, you know, we ask them why. And they basically want to expand their their living space or mm -hmm. something you know we let them know that that's a food source that you're losing right mm -hmm. and if they're you know if they still want to get rid of it then okay so then we you know we might take it down um, or whoever's taking it down will come and get it but besides the blessing of the removal of the tree it it takes quite a bit of time for me mm -hmm because I don't just go out and start cutting up, I'm going to, that, oh, this is what it's going to be. It, it has to come to me in a dream, mm -hmm. right? And so I develop a relationship because it's the spirit of our, of our living honua, mm -hmm. right? And so that spirit will come to you and tell you what, how it's going to transform because mm -hmm. it knows it's going to become something, whether it be, you know, one type of surfboard or another type. It, you know, I don't ever know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it could take me two years mm -hmm. before that wood actually speaks to me. And one day it just says it's going to be an alaya or mm -hmm. a kiko'o, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And and the journey begins because it's it's a it it takes that I believe it takes that amount of time to for for the laau the kumulaau to make that transformation spiritually. Mm -hmm. Because this is what we refer to as like a kinolau, that it is embodiment kinola, yes. of that element, that energy. Yes, and and so what what I try to teach today to our to our keiki and and our community is how important it is to do that, mm -hmm. to allow the wood to speak to you, mm -hmm. you know, because it'll it's it's not your journey, it's their journey, mm -hmm. right? So we just helping in the transformation of their spiritual journey. That's such a, uh, with today's world, how fast paced, how westernized and how developing things are going, that type of mentality of really take that time, take that patience to think about that approach, I think is muchly needed. Um, that being said, and we'll, we'll end off this with, with a very limited time that we have, but from you yeah. with all the works and all the experiences the kupuna that you were best blessed with in the past with surfing the surfing industry today and just the sport not really the practice but the sport of surfing um what do you think s surfing traditional surfing and that aloha that that spirit of healing what does that mean to you and how does that relate um to surfing in general and especially to the industry, I think, surfing industry. How can aloha? Make well, the concept that? of aloha is, is is really significant because, you know, I grew up at a time, especially in the professional uh, modern surfing world, where I actually left because I had a problem dealing mm -hmm. with 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 uh, changes occurring, and with the people, and you know, the loss of our various kupuna, were, which were technically my my kumu and who guided mm -hmm. me and stuff like that. And I think everybody speaks the word and they say aloha, but I don't think they really comprehend or understand the significance of aloha. Mm -hmm. And in the surfing world and the surfing industry, I think they tend to bastardize it or prostitute mm -hmm. it a, mm -hmm. a little bit too much because when I'm involved, I try to, I try to share with them how important aloha is because it's just like us because you know we are the people you know mm -hmm. we're the living people and when we share aloha and when we say aloha we don't just say aloha as a word we say aloha as a spirit mm -hmm. 
and it's really hard for them to comprehend that. But if we continue, just continuously share that with them, I think eventually they'll get it because aloha is that that sense of bringing two spirits together mm -hmm. and making those spirits one. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the hardest thing in the corporate world of the surfing uh, today to do that because again it's just you know they don't understand it mm -hmm. and you know but it it doesn't mean we have to stop mm -hmm. it it's it's who we are what is aloha to you aloha is to to be able to come face to face with one another and share our spirit together mm -hmm. you know and aloha comes in many forms mm -hmm. right just because we say aloha because in an old time the aloha could be you know two brothers meeting and preparing for battle mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean i hate you mm -hmm. it just means i'm i'm on the other side but on the battlefield if we meet we fight to the best we can and i'm not there to kill you but the one that falls first i will come back and i will aloha you mm -hmm. i will make sure your spirit's okay mm -hmm. yeah. awesome well, perfect timing because that gives me one minute to close up the show before <laughs> we get cut off from air. But mahalo, Uncle. I mean, mahalo there's so way. much. And I asked this to Uncle earlier, so just be prepared. There will be a part two to this conversation. Ah. This is more focused. Oh, by the way, you're doing a part two <laughs> to the conversation. The first part is really focused on um, he'enalu or, or surfing. The next part, I'm super stoked. We're going to be on location with Uncle to um, have him share more about Papaholua or mountain surfing, I guess, you know, oh, you land surfing. Oh, you're going to rocks, huh? Yeah, if we could, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but he's going to be sharing a little bit more about holua sledding, which is um, more surfing the mountains and surfing surfing the land and, and how the Hawaiians integrated the two. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very ono. I'm very full of all that ono delicious stuff. The, the biggest thing that really stuck with me, and I think I want to leave this with the audience, is the connection that you explain with the process from from the kinolao, from the embodiment of the tree to the final board, that connection, the same thing that you talked about, aloha, that that spiritual connection to to yourself, to who who you're talking to, that love. Um, if if we can translate and parallel the two, treat aloha as if how Hawaiians treated traditional surfboards and that whole spiritual connection, I think that is the answer to aloha. Yes, it is. We're over time. I don't know if they cut us off, but mahalo nui. Stay tuned to next month. Olelo Channel 53. Aloha Authentic. Check out alohaauthentic.org for past episodes. Hui ho.